So this is working with legacy databases in Ecto. Uh, so hopefully you're in the right spot. I'm Jeffrey Lessel. I'm very excited to be here. When I was growing up, Seattle was one of my favorite cities, even though I'd never been here before. So when I was in middle school, I decided, you know what, the CLC Hawks can be my team. So, because uh, I, I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, they're no longer anymore, sorry. Uh, I ended up being a Titans fan, lived in Nashville for a bit. But anyway, growing up in Little Rock, there were no professional teams, so I was like, well, I'll just pick one, and Seattle sounded cool. Um, and then my favorite movie of all time is War Games, uh, and that's basically the guy, you know, David Lightman is based out of Seattle, and so um, just watching that over and over and over, I was like, Seattle seems so cool. Uh, so I always wanted to go there, um, and then when I was 18, after I graduated high school, my dad surprised me. And we just, he's like, we're getting on a plane. And I was like, okay. So we got on a plane. I didn't know where we were going. And we ended up in Seattle. And I was like, this is perfect. Uh, so here's a shot of me being so happy to finally be in Seattle. Uh, look at that hair. That is amazing. <laughs> the 90s. I even have my pager down there. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, so anyway, I love Seattle. I'm very excited to be here. Obviously, this isn't Seattle. This is Bellevue. But this area is awesome, and I love it. So I'm very excited to be here with you guys today. So first thing I want to cover is, what do I mean when I say a legacy database? Um, some of you guys come in here, and you've been working with databases that have been around for decades, maybe. Uh, some of you come in here, and you maybe have one that's been around for three months. Um, and both have their challenges, and both have their little funky quirks. Um, so I thought, well, let me define for you what I'm going to be talking about when I discuss legacy. The first thing is, obviously, it's already existing. Um, legacy kind of means it's been existed in the past and we're bringing that forward to the future and we got to deal with it now. Uh, the second thing is kind of obviously it already has tables and it has data in those tables. So we got to figure out a way to bring that information into our app to be able to use it. Uh, another thing is it could be that it's running on old database software. Um, you know, we have a lot of stuff like, you know, PostgreSQL is the, the, the default for Phoenix, and you've got MySQL, you've got MSSQL, um, but there may be some older databases that you're having to deal with uh, that you need to bring that information into kind of a more modern um, framework. So here's some goals for the talk. Uh, the first thing is we're going to kind of identify some of the problems that some of you may be dealing with. And let me just state from the beginning that there's going to be some problems that some of you are dealing with right now that I haven't even considered. Um, I know that a lot of the database world is, uh, it can get messy, it can get deep, and um, probably past my understanding of what you're dealing with, so I apologize if you came in here thinking I was going to hit one specific thing, and I probably won't hit that one specific thing for you. Uh, but hopefully we'll cover some more wider ranging issues that you may be dealing with uh, when you're working with a legacy database. Another thing is, uh, after we identify some of those problems, I'm going to kind of present some solutions that I found to some of those problems. Uh, specifically around a particular database I found online uh, to use that's, that was kind of a fun side project. And finally, at the end, again, we may not focus exactly what, what you're dealing with right this moment if you're working with a legacy database, but we'll, you should be able to take something that already exists and bring that into um, a new Phoenix app or a new Elixir app uh, from this talk. So let's identify the first problem. The first problem that you guys may be dealing with is your database has tables, um, and it usually does. Another issue is you've got funky column name formats. Um, there are uh, defaults that Ecto assumes you're going to be using when you're using a database. And a lot of times when you have a database that's already existing, those defaults don't make any sense for your database world. Um, so we're going to cover how to uh, overcome some of these funky column names. It could be things like you know, camel case names. It could be all caps. Uh, it could be, um, I don't know unicode characters, you know, whatever it may be, we're going we're to cover that. Another issue is um, non-integer primary keys. Uh, there are some databases who just don't really care about counting their rows 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, but they may use something else like uh, maybe a UUID, a universal identifier. Um, so it's a, it's a string in, um, in the row that's basically the, the primary identifier for that particular uh, row in the database. Another issue is um, you may have some custom field types that Ecto doesn't know how to deal with. Um, and so when you're trying to bring your, your, uh, your world, your application into the modern world, you're like, Ecto you know, wasn't even a sparkle in someone's eye when this, thing, when this database was created and these field types were created. Uh, so we're going to go over a quick implementation of how to implement some, uh, some custom field types. And finally, uh, some schemas. So this 
to be completely upfront, is an area that I've never dealt with uh, in a database. Like, there's database-specific schemas um, that I've, I've read about, so this is one I don't have experience with, but I'll still be able to describe a little bit of how to uh, utilize schemas in, in databases. All right, so let's get to some solutions and get to the meat of this. Uh, the first thing is I want to let you know that a lot of the code examples I'm going through here um, can be found on my website. It's just jeffreylussell.com slash elixirconf2017. Uh, I try to go through um, each of the different uh, example code and, and make a little bullet point about what this particular thing might solve. And uh, once the video is up, I'll also just, just link that in there uh, to let you guys take a look at that. Um, so for my dive into this, I decided to use something called the Ergast Motor Racing Database. Uh, as you may be able to tell from the backgrounds of the slides, uh, I'm a huge uh, F Formula One fan. Um, I love watching the races. My, my brother and my, my dad and I have a little custom-made Formula One uh, fantasy league that, that we've dreamt up and, and do. Um, so I love Formula One. I started following about 10 years ago, and one thing I know about Formula One is it's much older than 10 years. And um, there's a lot of history in Formula One that I thought, oh, it'd be kind of cool to know those things. Well, this guy, I don't know if his name's Ergast, to be honest, um, but this motor racing database is uh, a database of pretty much every race that's happened in Formula One history, including the drivers, the circuit, uh, the results. Um, in the past, I think it's since 2011, he's had like every single lap time set on a lap in a race. Um, so it's pretty extensive, and it covers a lot of history. He also offers an API that you can hit, and because of that, um, the site itself is pretty slow a lot of times. Um, but what he also offers is a, just a complete download of the database, the whole database you can just download for free. Um, and that's uh, just available as an SQL dump that just it drops the tables if they exist, it creates them, and then it imports all the data. Uh, so if you guys want to use that um, database to kind of create your own mirror of what I'm doing on this, then um, that's a place you can get that. And again, if it's slow, you know the reason why. I'm hoping to maybe get in touch with them and see if I can mirror it or something, because it's a cool database, and it's unfortunate that sometimes it's out of service. Another thing I want to mention before we go on is um, a lot of these solutions are using things that don't quite exist yet in the current version of Ecto, which is 2.1. Um, so some of these things are only working in 2.2. And so if you are um, just using your own uh, a new Elixir app that's you may be outside of Phoenix. That shouldn't be an issue. You can just use the release candidate. Um, but if you are using Phoenix, uh, Phoenix obviously brings it its own version of, of Ecto, but you can override that. Now, I say that, and if you're, if you're interested, here's how you override it. Um, you can put in the override true uh, as an option. Um, now, saying that, here's a disclaimer, I don't know what this is going to do to your application. <laughs> in this particular sense, uh, or in, this, in, my, in my case, I'm just using it to read data. Um, I'm not writing anything. I'm not changing anything. It's basically just read-only information for me. So I'm not too scared about losing data or, or things going haywire. It's just a fun app for me. But if, if you're doing something like, you know, I don't know, storing social security numbers or doing bank transactions, this may not be the best idea for you uh, until they get to a stable, a stable state. So let's, let's get to it. Uh, the first thing is existing tables and data. Uh, to do that, one solution you can use is mixecto.dump and mixecto.load. Now, a lot of databases like the, um, the Ergas database I was discussing earlier, it can be transferred over through, through a utility like uh, MySQL dump, uh, just a command line utility that dumps all the, the tables, all the data into a, a text file that you can then load back into MySQL. Um, well, Ecto has um, some tasks built in that do this for you, uh, for you as well. So it'll automatically use whatever tool uh, it needs to for that particular database you're using, whether that's Postgres or SQLite or, or MySQL. Um, and you can uh, use that to bring data into your app. Um, if you have, there, there, there's a couple of ways you can do it also. Another way you can do it is you can create uh, migrations for each of the existing tables. Just kind of mirror what uh, the table structure looks like when you get the data and you need to recreate it in your own app and just kind of make some migrations, whether that's in one huge migration that creates a bunch of tables or uh, separate migrations for each table. Um, you can use that to kind of recreate the world that existed when you started your application. Um, there's some pros and cons to both of those. Um, I kind of like the, just the mix ecto.load and mix ecto.dump way myself. Um, one reason is because of this uh, little tip right here. It says, you know, if you're, if you're using uh, the structure file that this generates and you want to, um, you know, commit that into uh, your version control system or something, then you can 
alias mix ecto.migrate to migrate and then straight after migrating, go ahead and dumping. So you can alias that. And so if you wanted to do that just in your mix file, um, just, hit a, just put in a mix ecto.migrate alias and um, have it run the migration, then run the dump. And from there, you can commit that to your version control system and you know, pass that around your team, however you need to do it, uh, to make sure that that structure file is always up to date. Um, I kind of like that. Uh, there are, there, you can, I think you can configure it to also dump the data um, by just passing out a few different um, uh, uh, flags. And if you need to, you can completely make your own little task that, that does it with all the flags, the data involved as well. Um, but that's, that's one way to, uh, to use Ecto with a legacy database with existing columns and, uh, and data in there. So with that being said, let's move on to the next one, which is uh, funky column name formats. Um, I know that uh, in this particular database, the column names are in camel case. And uh, if you've used Ecto in the past, you know that um, it defaults to underscores instead of camel casing it. And so if you just let it try to do its own thing, it'll fail on you. It's like, I don't know what this, this, this particular column doesn't exist. What do we do here? So to do that, there's an option for fields that's uh, source. And you can pass uh, into source the column name of the particular column you're trying to, to get into your application. So let's take a look at an example here. So here I've got uh, just a describe of a table that uh, has the races in it. And there's two different um, columns in there that may stand out at you. One is the race ID, which is the primary key for races. And the second is a circuit ID, which is basically the, the racing circuit, the racing track they were on uh, for this particular race. So what if we wanted to focus in on the circuit ID first? How do we get um, the circuit ID into Ecto so that we can use it uh, and use it easily? And again, um, this kind of mirrors, we have our schema here um, defined, uh, kind of an API way. But we have the year, the round, the name, the date, the URL. Those are, those are pretty easy. Those are our standard Ecto types that you can bring in and not have to worry about it. Um, however, we still have that circuit ID. So if you wanted to do like a belongs to, this is what you would write, right? You'd do belongs to circuit and then the module name. And I have it circuit alias here. Uh, so it, it uh, goes to the API circuit schema. But again, if we tried to do that, it would go to circuit underscore ID. Um, which we don't want. That doesn't exist. It'll give you an error if you try to use that. So to get past that, we use the source uh, option. And so here we just do source, circuit ID, and camel case uh, as an atom, and it knows what to do with that. So not a problem. So that would be our schema for uh, our races. However, if you look back at the, uh, the describe, you'll see that we still have that race ID column to deal with. And um, if you are familiar with Ecto, you also know that when you create a schema, you don't have to specify that you want an ID column um, or a primary key. It, it automatically assumes, hey, you know what, you're using a database, you're probably going to want an ID. Um, however, you can override that with a, um, a module attribute called primary key. And so here we define the primary key module attribute. Um, it's a, a tuple. And there's three different parts of that tuple that it needs uh, to work. The first is a, fi a field name. In this case, um, we're going to call it ID. This is what we're going to refer to it as in our application. I don't want to keep calling it race ID because to me that, you know, I guess it makes sense, but it's, it doesn't fit in my world, my, my view of databases. So I just want to call it ID in my application. Uh, the second um, option is the type. And we'll get into this a little bit more uh, in the next solution. Uh, but the majority of the time you're just going to want an ID, uh, which is just kind of an integer type that, you know, auto increments. Um, and then finally, we have options. And here's where we pass in, again, the source option, where we say the source is the race ID column, but with the camel case. Uh, and so that's how you would um, do that form primary key. And so now this is what our schema looks like for a race. Um, that kind of wraps that part up. But one, one thing we need to do now is, uh, back to that primary key, what about primary keys that aren't IDs, that are maybe integers? I'm sorry, are, are strings or UUIDs? Um, well, again, we have that primary key module attribute that we can utilize to override some of the things that Ecto assumes about your database. Um, in particular here, uh, you, can, you remember that we had the, uh, the primary key, we had the field, the field name, the type, and the options. Well, that type doesn't have to be ID. It could be really any Ecto type. So here we're just going to say it's a binary ID. And in that case, it's going to um, know that it's a string, so it's going to be UUID, and you can utilize that. So when it's going to the database, it's not going to complain to you that, hey, you know what, this, I, I got this weird thing that's definitely not a number, so I don't know what you're trying to, try to pull on me. Um, this, will, this will satisfy it, and it will realize what to do at that point. Um, so if you have other schemas that are 
uh, trying to access um, information from this particular table or in other tables through like, you know, a has many or a belongs to relationship, um, you can uh, use the source uh, field option on that belongs to line um, to identify the, the column name. But you can also you set another um, attribute, a module attribute called foreign key ID, or for, sorry, foreign key type. And here we can say it's a binary ID. Now on, on the ergas database, this, doesn't, this, this actually isn't an issue. There are no non-integer uh, primary keys. Um, so uh, if you do download that, you're not going to run into this particular problem. Uh, but it's something that um, I know that some of you probably are, are working with and you need to know how to handle. So this is how you handle that. So what about call, uh, sorry, tables that have no primary key? There's maybe some join tables in there. Um, and again, Ecto assumes that you're going to have an ID field on there, ID column. Uh, but what if you don't? So again, we, we look at this particular um, describe, and it's, this is for lap times. And first of all, I'll point out, I don't point this out in the slides, but I'll point out here, the lap times, uh, the, call, the table itself is camel cased. Um, so when you define your schema, which we'll see in the next slide here, you can just, in your quotes, put that in camel case. It, it shouldn't be an issue at all. Um, but we can see here there's no, there's no ID field. We just have a race ID, a driver ID, you know, lap, position, time, milliseconds. Uh, but we need to tell it not to expect to find an ID field on here. So again, back to the primary key, we can just say, you know what, primary key false. There's just not one here. Uh, so don't even, don't even go looking for one. Another um, interesting thing about this particular schema that, uh, that we could look at is um, there's these belongs to down here. Now, earlier I used a source field for a belongs to. You can also use the, uh, the foreign key. Um, however, that, uh, the, the source assumes that you're going to um, access that particular data with an underscore. So, for example, uh, if, if we had said belongs to race, race, uh, source, race ID, then um, it would go ahead and define um, a race ID with an underscore that you could use on your, on your maybe your froms and your, your ecto queries, things like that. However, if you use foreign key, it doesn't do that. Um, so if you want to have more control over your uh, columns and your belongs tos, uh, you can sell it, you know what, don't define the field here. Just let me tell you that it belongs to a race, and then I'll define what needs to happen for that particular column that the race um, ID goes into. And so there we can see that we're, we're actually defining a race ID field and a driver ID field, and giving that one a source of the, the camel case. So that, was, that might be a, a funky issue that you run into. Uh, I actually hit it a couple times in this app that um, I, I'm just, it's so uh, beyond, not beyond, it's, it's outside of my realm of thinking of normal database structure that uh, I just don't even consider that sometimes. And I'm like, why isn't this working? It's like, oh yeah, I've got to do the foreign key or the source and, and get it working because it's expecting that particular format. All right, so another thing we need to talk about are custom field types. And again, in the Ergas database, this particular thing doesn't, pose a problem. It's not an issue. Uh, so to discuss this, I'm going to propose uh, a crazy um, idea, kind of contrived example. Uh, so let's say we wanted to um, open up our website uh, for comments, for user comments. Now we know that um, the Ergas database can be downloaded and it's constantly updated with, you know, every race that happens it's updated. Like there's a race on Sunday, so my particular copy is already out of date, I'm sure. Um, and uh, he'll uh, upload that to his website. So what if you wanted to automatically download that structure file uh, and that dump into your database maybe every, after every race? You've got a calendar, you want to set some schedule that it downloads it and imports it, um, and uh, we're going to have that database, and we're going to have another database, and that database is going to have like user comments for a race or something. So, um, and then let's pretend that you're like super... Um, uh, you're worried about customer data in your database, and you want to make sure that everything's encrypted and nothing unencrypted ever touches your database. Um, but you also don't want to kind of code through um, on every time you need to save something to your database. You want to um, go through and, and do all the conversions by hand. So let's define a custom field type of an encrypted field in your database. Now, uh, another disclaimer, this pro is probably isn't the best way to do this. Um, there is a talk later today about plugging holes in your Phoenix application, uh, plugging security holes, though so this may be one of those security holes. Uh, again, this is a completely contrived example, but it should help to illustrate how to implement your own Ecto custom type. Oh, and so th the solution is Ecto type. Um, there are some built-in types already in Ecto, and Ecto 
even provides its own custom ecto type, uh, and that's the ecto.uuid that you can use. Uh, so to define our own type, um, we just need to implement a behavior, the ecto.type behavior. So ecto provides these uh, types built in um, without you having to do anything. You've got ID, you've got binary ID, you've got floats, boolean, strings, binaries, an array, uh, and that array, you can also tell it what to expect inside the array, what kind of type is going to be in the array, what's an array of. Uh, you got maps, maps with an inner type, decimals, dates, times, naive date times, and UTC date times. So if you need something beyond that, like our encrypted field, then you can implement your own type. So let's do that. So we're going to call our uh, module maybe encrypted field, um, where we can use in any place we want to have an encrypted field in our database. Um, there's a few different things we need to do. First of all is we need to make sure that Elixir knows that we are implementing a behavior here. And when you implement a behavior, uh, the behavior defines certain functions that have to exist in your implementation, in your definition, to make it work. So in our case, we have, let me back up a little bit, we have four uh, functions that the ecto type behavior expects. We have cast, or we have type, cast, load, and uh, dump. We're going to go over each of those in a little bit more detail here. So the first thing we need to do, again, is tell Elixir that we are defining this behavior. We are implementing this behavior, rather. Uh, the type basically uh, returns the underlying schema for the custom type. So in our case, it's a binary. It's, it's going to be a string. Um, so we're just going to have a, an encrypted field that in the database itself, it's just a string. Um, so that's what type does. It's a super simple uh, function. The next one is cast. And this is called when um, you're casting values by like an ecto change set or you're passing arguments in ecto.query. Uh, so you need to cast um, information given to, to it uh, into what it expects in the database. So to cast the, our particular string, let's say a comment, um, you know, this was an awesome race, I was there, and you know, turn five uh, was great. Um, then we need to encrypt that before uh, we do like a, a um, pass that into a change set or uh, try to find that in the database through a, a query. So that's what we do here. We, it always expects a tuple of OK or error um, and uh, the, the data that it, it it's needs to be put in. Um, so in our case, we're, we're just, we have a, a, a guard function here that it's a binary. Um, you don't have to have that. Just put that in there for illustrations purposes. Uh, so we're passing the string into this, and then we're encrypting it using a, a hex module called Cypher um, that will encrypt that and, and, and cast it for us. The second thing is load. And um, load and dump, to me, while I was going through this and learning this stuff, uh, I couldn't quite get the hang of which was which. And so um, the, I will, OK, so the uh, documentation around Elixir and Ecto and Phoenix and a lot of the other open source uh, modules out there is unbelievably amazing. So if you guys haven't just, I don't know, decided one afternoon just to open up a module and take a look at the documentation for it, I'd recommend you do that. It's so much more documentation lines than code lines. It's unbelievable. Uh, in fact, I was telling my friend Jesse um, earlier uh, when we were preparing for uh, our talks, I was like, you know what? If um, every time I, I prepare, try to prepare a talk or a blog post or whatever it is, um, and I'm gathering research, uh, gathering data, and researching the topic, and I start looking in the documentation, I'm like, it's already done. I, I, don't, have to, I don't have to tell you guys anything. Just go look in the documentation, end of, end of discussion. Um, obviously, it, that's not always the case. And this particular one is one where it kind of didn't quite make sense to me until I messed around with it a little bit. So hopefully, I'll, I'll try to make it clear. So load is when it goes from the database into Elixir. So when you're trying to load information from the database, take it from the database field, and load it into your Elixir application, this is the, the process it needs to go through. And for us, it's going to be super simple. All we need to do is take the encrypted field in the database, which is just a string of, of an, an encrypted data, take that out, and then decrypt it and pass it back into our Elixir application. So again, it expects a tuple. So OK, we've got an OK. We needed, if we needed to do any sort of um, uh, error handling here, we could. Um, but ours is, again, contrived and super simple. So we're just going to keep it OK. Um, we're going to decrypt the string and send that on to Elixir. Um, and then dump is the other way. So if we have data inside Elixir and we need to get that into the database, this is when dump comes in. So when we pass a string, like this is a comment, um, and we need to get that into the database, but we don't want the database ever to see the string, this is a comment, then we need to encrypt it here before it gets to the database. So again, this is from Elixir to the database, and load is from the database into Elixir. All right, so now we have implemented our behavior, our encrypted field type. So let's um, go into a fake IEX session here in a second to utilize that. First, we need to uh, make a 
a field that uses this. So I just have a, a stupid schema here for um, an encrypt uh, schema, and it has one field that's just text, and it has our encrypted field. Um, and again, that's the, the specific, specific ectotype that we've defined. So through there, we have, again, in our IX session here, we've got encrypt, we've got, you know, this is a secret message as our text, and we're going to put that into our repo, into the database. And you'll, so you'll see here, when it goes into the debug output, when it actually calls the, the SQL to put that into the database, it doesn't know anything about the string. This is a secret. It's already converted it before it gets there into blah, 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 right? The, that encrypted string. So none of that unencrypted data ever hits the database. And again, if we, if we check right into the MySQL itself and just select all, the, all our, our columns or all our rows in, um, in encrypts, we can see that that information is encrypted before it got to the database. So how do we get that back out? Well, since we implemented both load and dump and, um, and the cast, we can use it in, in a query. So we can say from e and encrypt where e.txt equals this is a secret message. And again, we have no idea how it's stored in the database. We just know that it's there and somehow it's encrypted and you know, we may not have the key. But when we have the query pump, pumped out, it again encrypts that query, uh, sorry, it encrypts that string when it goes to the database itself. So it doesn't have to, you don't have to know anything about how the encryption works other than you've got that one particular ectotype that you've defined, and it does that for every field that you want to do it for. But then we get back our, our, um, what we thought we were going to get back, which is the text, this is a secret message, unencrypted, so we can use that in our application. All right, so another thing we can talk about are schemas. And again, this is one where I don't really have real-world application. Um, I do know that there are some databases um, that have uh, more organization than just tables. They have got schemas that have maybe like F1 and then races. Um, so uh, there is a module attribute called schema prefix that you can use if you have this particular problem. And um, this uh, can be a little tricky to get around because it only works um, in, uh, well, if you're using like, if you want to use like a query, like an ecto query, you say, you know, from A in races uh, where um, and then, sorry, not in races, but like f1.races, you have to specify the schema in the where. Um, so this sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. The documentation is much more clear than I can be because, again, I don't have much uh, experience on this. But let's say we wanted to define a schema prefix for this particular module. So we have our race, and our schema is going to be f1. And just as it, it specifies in the name, it's going to prefix our table name uh, with this particular schema. So let's look at the, if we wanted to, uh, to run a, um, a, like a, a simple git for this, um, we can see that um, here's the debug output, kind of pretty printed, um, but it's got that, that prefix in front of it. So it's selecting from the f1.races table, which is the schema prefix attached to races. Um, so let's move forward a little bit and discuss another kind of uh, contrived example. So let's go back to our idea of um, we want to, excuse me, automatically bring in uh, the database every time there's a race, so we have all the, the fresh information. But at the same time, we want to allow comments and, and user data. And uh, we don't want to um, overwrite any of that user data, but we don't care if we destroy and recreate that race information every time there's a race. Um, we can just completely destroy it, bring in the, the full dump every time, and recreate the database. We don't care. We can do that every day. Um, but for the user data, we want to make sure we don't touch that. It could be also a situation where you've got a legacy database you have um, that you may be trying to transition. Uh, so you've got uh, a bunch of information in there that um, you want to use and be able to utilize, maybe update. Um, but you also uh, want to utilize a, a better, maybe newer database um, where you can start putting in uh, fresh information, maybe new information. Um, in, in uh, things like Rails and things like that, it is, I, I can't imagine trying to do this in Rails or some other frameworks, um, but thankfully Ecto makes it super simple uh, to do that. So we're going to take a look at um, multiple databases. This is, again, kind of a, a what-if scenario. Um, but thankfully, Ecto makes it super simple. Um, all we need to do is just define two different repos. Uh, who would have known, right? Um, so we, first of all, we have our, our legacy repo up here, um, and it's using MySQL. And then we've got uh, as another repo, and it's using Postgres. So it, you don't even have to use the same type of database to be able to use two different kinds or two different databases in your application. Which, when I first knew that, and again coming from Rails land, it was just like, you know, what, what can I do with all these repos? You know, I could have like databases strewn all over the country, and each one carries maybe like one table, and um, it knows what to which one to call. And then I was like, okay, rain it in. That's stupid. 
Um, but we also need to make sure, if you do have that, also that the config F1 saver Ecto repos, like that Ecto repos op option to the config. When I was first getting started, I was like, why is this thing a list? This doesn't make any sense. Um, if I had just one repo, why do I have to put this in a list? But then I realized when I, when I started looking at multiple repos, I was like, ah, because you can pass in multiple repos and let it configure all those repos at the same time, which is really cool. So if you want to do this, um, you also need to make sure that you start it up and, and that it's supervised. Uh, so when you create a new application with Ecto involved, whether it's through Mix or um, through Phoenix, uh, you um, automatically uh, get an Ecto repo that's supervised. Um, but you need to make, since we've got another one created, we need to make sure both of them are supervised. So just a, a gotcha that can happen that you need to make sure you do is um, pass in the other legacy repo as well as your regular repo to your supervisors just to make sure that uh, those are being supervised. Now, um, right now, these particular databases are ones that are, um, th there's adapters built for them. So if you have uh, an old database software that you're using, um, it m probably won't be able to interface directly with it right now. But if you want to create that, uh, I'm certainly sure you could, and they'd be, uh, welcome that. Um, but as long as you have one of these types of databases or can get your information into one of these types of databases, you should be able to use them pretty well uh, through, this, through these methods. Um, so honestly, that's, that's what I've got today. Uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. We do have uh, some time for questions. I want to take uh, a minute to thank these people for their awesome Formula One pictures. Um, I'm Jeffrey Lessel again. I, I blog and, and post at jeffreylessel.com um, and um, geolessel on Twitter. I uh, also want to mention that I'm writing a book right now, Phoenix in Action for Manning. Um, this is the first time that's been publicly announced, so I'm excited to be writing that for them. Um, and hopefully going to be in Meep sometime soon. Uh, and um, very excited about what you guys uh, will think about it. Hopefully get a lot of feedback from you uh, and uh, like to make it very useful for you. Uh, so again, let's, let's see if there's any questions. Hopefully I can answer them. Yeah. That is a good question. And that's something also, oh yeah. Do you want them to re-answer the, re yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the question was um, for non-table things like schemes and, uh, sorry, not schemes, views and uh, like functions, right, procedures. Um, honestly, I don't know. Um, I don't think Ecto has something built in that will use that. You may be able to use like SQL fragments. Um, there is a function that Ecto has where you can just write straight SQL into, into Postgres or MySQL or whatever it is uh, if you need to use things like that. For example, like randomizing data. So if you need to order by rand, um, there isn't really something built into Ecto, as far as I know, that allows you to do that. So you can just use a fragment and say fragment and then order by rand, wherever, whatever rand uh, function your particular database has, um, and they'll know how to do that. Any other questions? All right, cool. Well, thank you guys for coming out.